so thank you everyone for joining us um, for Learn at Home. Um, we're, we've had this program for, we started this program in, uh, during pandemic and it has just grown into a wonderful community of people interested in learning. And so we thank you for joining us. We're really excited here to have, uh, to be talking to Sam Shoemaker, who's an artist and mycologist. He studied, he got his MFA at Yale in sculpture um, and has, what's been very interesting about the mycology field for me particularly is how it is dominated by, I would say amateur mycologists and these are like, uh, or we could say citizen scientists and how fantastic that is and how this empirical data that we're all learning. And like, as we, if anyone joined us last time with, um, with iNaturalist, it's kind of turning all of us into citizen scientists and kind of using this, the beauty of the internet and sharing knowledge in a, in a really wonderful way. Um, and so I just, we just wanted to thank, uh, we had seed funding for Learn at Home provided by the Gene Abishan Cinder Legacy Fund. Um, so we are extremely grateful for that. Um, and this Learn at Home is brought to you uh, by Subaru of Sherman Oaks, who without this couldn't be possible. Um, and without further ado, I'm going to uh, pass it over to Sam. Thank you, Alex. I'm gonna share my screen here. Uh, hi, everybody. Uh, so, hi, I, uh, my name is uh, Sam. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, I love talking about mushrooms. The challenge with these talks that I've been giving about mushrooms is really just fitting in all of the exciting stories and things that are happening in this field. I'll, a lot of the science is relatively new and there's um, the interest in these practices are uh, growing. It's still a very small field. Uh, mushrooms might be popping up on your Instagram feed um, and seem like they're everywhere, but um, there's not a lot of funding for the research of mushrooms quite yet. That's starting to change, um, but they play a really vital role in our ecosystems and they seem to uh, offer a lot of opportunity in some of the, the ecological disturbance that we're seeing and um, ways that we can rethink sustainable food systems. Um, so I'm gonna sort of circle back around to some of these ideas. It might take me the first 20 minutes to even get to an explanation of what a mushroom actually is and how we can think about these organisms and the kingdom that they exist in. Um, so just bear with me. I sort of have a rambling ADHD way of approaching some of these subjects and it, it can get quite complex. Uh, I also want to preface um, that, you know, I'm an artist. I don't have a traditional background in science. I don't consider myself a scientist uh, per se. Uh, we can really get into some cliches about what the meaning of art and science really is. And there is sort of a nebulous uh, uh, distinction between the two at times. Um, but I will say that um, I rely on people who have been doing this for a lot longer, um, who um, have looked at these things much closely. I might um, not take as um, detailed notes as some of the people that I work with and um, have learned from, and I'm in great ode to them. And throughout this talk, I'm going to sort of pay homage to some of the people who have uh, made this work that I'm doing possible. Um, but I really think as an artist, and I think um, whatever that means, it seems to allow me to have a certain level of creative freedom to explore these subjects, either visually, poetically, scientifically, or ecologically. So um, this sort of coming at this from a lot of different perspectives. So we'll get into it. So this is, um, um, these are a few of the sculptures that I've made over the past year. I collaborate with uh, medicinal, native, uh, rare, edible, gourmet, and all kinds of fungi that um, sometimes um, have a very sculptural presence in my work. I'm sorry, ambulance coming through. Uh, so these are reishi ganoderma um, mushrooms growing out of some of my ceramic vessels. Uh, these are some, in China, these are referred to as the mushroom of immortality. They last for a very long time and they dry like wood, unlike an oyster mushroom or a button mushroom that you would have in your kitchen. Um, that will get moldy and turn to mush um, in a few days. This mushroom um, lasts for years and years and years um, and its self-preserving uh, properties are one of the 
reasons that it's really useful to us medicinally. It's the, the most commonly consumed medicinal mushroom. It's been utilized for thousands of years throughout the world. Um, it's becoming increasingly popular in the US. Americans um, have a, a America's um, um, Americans and Europeans and Western traditions have a tradition of mycophobia. There's sort of a fear around mushrooms um, that we have had to overcome in order to get to where we are now. Um, most people associate mushrooms with rot and with disease. If, if I told you that there's a mushroom or mold or fungi growing in the bathroom, you would be grabbing chemicals and bleach um, and fungicide. And now we're starting to re-look at some of those relationships. So. I make artwork um, in grad school. I was doing a lot of different things. I wrote a rock opera for elementary school students in the basement of Yale. I um, was exploring a lot of different ideas and um, was trying to move closer to a practice where the things that I was making would evolve over time, that they, they wouldn't represent sort of a static uh, form distilled in space and this discrete object, but something that was living and breathing and carrying rhythm and uh, responding and, and able to talk with me and keep me company in the studio. And, and this is sort of a uh, scene in the practice of many contemporary artists. Oh, it seems my computer might have froze here. Give me just one moment. What are we, here we go. So here is an example some of you might be familiar with. This is a, uh, Pierre Huy's uh, installation at uh, Documenta in Germany. This is uh, sort of this dog. I was wandering the property um, with this painted leg and this sculpture in repose, this beehive living off of it. So these sort of sculptures that become these living ecosystems. This is uh, uh, often a very popular, um, very, uh, uh, there's a lot of writing about this piece and its influence. Um, one of my favorite contemporary artists and at, working in LA, Candace Lynn. This is uh, her installation at the Hammer Biennial, often living plants, uh, poisonous plants, and um, uh, sort of ecologies that uh, tie to colonial histories that she is interested in. Um, so distilling uh, opium and, and, and fer fermented uh, cultures and the installation that she creates that look quite different from um, the day that they are installed to um, where they end up at the end of the, the process. So, um, of course, uh, I can't talk about mushrooms without mentioning the great John Cage, very big influence on me um, since I was very young. Um, John Cage, uh, sort of an artist associated with fluxus and um, chance operations and sort of using uh, randomized uh, properties and game um, structures within his work to compose the pieces that he did was very um, a, 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 a a student of uh, the mushroom. He spent many of his days um, wandering the forests of the East Coast with his uh, nose deep in the club moss, identifying um, rare and poisonous fungi and um, supporting himself as an artist by selling gourmet mushrooms to uh, fancy restaurants in New York City. So, um, so I started to, um, study. I, I had been interested in, in, in mushrooms for a long time and they hadn't really found a way in my, my studio. Uh, and I started to experiment. I noticed that everyone was cultivating these mushrooms out of uh, these plastic bags because uh, these myco bags um, can um, uh, survive the heat treatment that is required in mushroom cultivation to sterilize our substrates. Uh, and I thought, well, you know, I'm using ceramics. That is a material that can, uh, you know, protect the mushroom and be this vessel to, to carry this living culture. So here's sort of a process of where uh, one of these Ganoderma pieces goes through over the course of uh, three months. So that was something that seemed pretty obvious to me. And I was going to these mushroom conferences and asking, you know, why are we using these plastic bags? Has anybody tried, you know, ceramic or glass? And it's really simple ideas like they're not highly scientific, but just looking at, um, you know, the science that people were exploring and the cultivation practices and um, pairing them with the sculpture materials that I was familiar with. Uh, so um, a lot of my time in grad school was spent in the science labs, um, culturing uh, mushrooms, collecting spores, cloning uh, mushrooms that I was finding around the campus and uh, kind of studying them um, in these sterile laboratory and bringing them back to my studio. 
Um, so various experiments sort of created these um, vessels and carts that I would bring around the school, um, sort of casting sculptures um, using mushroom mycelium, uh, feeding uh, old art catalogs to my mushrooms and getting them to uh, fruit off of them. Um, spending a lot of time outdoors, being in the, in the being around the mosquitoes, being in the sweat, um, walking around my dog, um, seeing what we could find and identify. Um, and around this time, I saw a, um, I went to a, attended a lecture from the great mycologist Trad Cotter, who has an, a massive operation in South Carolina, Mushroom Mountain. Um, he's a really, really interesting uh, mycologist. And I saw him talk and he was presenting all of these um, experimental research that he was doing in remediation and um, um, water filtration and medicine and science and all of this experimental stuff that he was doing. He said, well, and I do all of this and sort of at the end of the lecture, he said, and, and I, at our facility, we grow this many hundred pounds of gourmet mushrooms in order to fund all of that work that I want to do. That's the fun stuff. And I love growing gourmet mushrooms, but the gourmet mushrooms make all of this possible. Um, and I thought, oh, that's a pretty interesting way of working. I could figure that out. And coming out of grad school with an art degree, uh, your career prospects aren't that, there aren't that many options. You know, a lot of people go into academia. Um, I was finishing school during COVID and just felt like, oh, the school's kind of abandoned students and teachers. So I was like, well, I'm gonna do my own thing. I'm gonna grow mushrooms and use that to support my art practice. And that'll allow me to do all of these things that I'm interested in. Um, so I moved back to LA. I have this facility with a basement, start the small operation. And this is where Michael Michael starts. Um, so this is me. These are some of the bags and gourmet mushrooms that I am um, fruiting. So I have my sculptures alongside the things that um, I am selling at the farmer's market. It's a very small operation. We only grow about 40, 50 pounds a week. Uh, we sell out before 11 a.m. Um, I grow the mushrooms that I think um, that I would like to eat. So these are speckled chestnut mushrooms. These are mushrooms that are becoming um, increasingly popular in the US. We've got some gold oysters here, the king oysters. Um, my favorite oyster, the king. Um, so this is my supportive and awesome partner, Elizabeth. Uh, we, we go to the, the farmer's market together. This is Atwater, you can find us there. We, we sell out um, quickly, but uh, on Sundays, you can find us in Atwater if you live in LA. Um, and in the background, there's sort of a uh, other experiments that I'm doing. So I'm gonna get into this a little bit later of what these words mean, but uh, I've been interested in micro-material, ways that we can actually make packaging material, we can make furniture, building materials, using mushrooms and agricultural byproducts, things that would go to the landfill and um, wouldn't have a purpose assigned to them or use that are actually quite useful and, and alternative to plastic and petroleum-based products that we use and uh, the science is relatively simple. And then when you learn about these things, like a lot of things we talk about, it's uh, like, well, why haven't we been doing this? This makes a lot of sense and it's pretty simple. Um, some experiments, this one um, is kind of in early stages of the first time I've publicly shared these images, but a friend of mine, Lucia Rabisi and I have been uh, trying to make these, uh, fabricate these um, mushroom massage foam rollers um, she actually sent me this image yesterday of a Ganoderma mushroom that was uh, hosted on a palm tree in Hollywood, which really uh, blew my mind. Um, palm trees and eucalyptus are trees that you um, don't see mushrooms growing off of too um, often. So collecting species like this in my local area in order to use mushrooms for applications uh, in the field is really exciting to me. We make uh, we're starting to move towards medicinal extractions. We'll get into that a little bit. Um, so yeah, this is a bit, some rambling thoughts. This is what I do. Um, and now I'm gonna kind of transition into um, some of the macro uh, ideas behind mycology and how our understanding and relationship to them has changed um, and ways that we have looked at the mushrooms role um, you know, millions of years ago. So uh, I, I, I love to start with this slide. Um, this is from the great um, Mushroom at the End of the World, is a book written by the Santa Cruz academic, uh, Anna Singh. Um, and she talks about this um, prize Matsutake mushroom that can be worth uh, two, two um, 
matsutake mushrooms can be worth up to hundreds of dollars in Japan. It's a surprise gourmet mushroom. You won't see it in the U.S. Uh, so often. It's but it's a uh, you know, it, it appears under um, unpredictable circumstances on the wild. It's not something that I can grow in my basement. Um, it requires old growth forests. Um, and many people have uh, tried to perfect the uh, science of finding these mushrooms in the wild. But uh, one thing that we do know about it is it seems to thrive in areas of ecological um, disturbance. So after the bombing of Hiroshima, this tragedy of epic proportions, um, we, we have this mushroom, it's the first sign of growth. And this is something you'll see throughout um, the sort of field of mycology is that mushrooms pop up when um, animals and plants seem to really struggle. So when a tree falls in the forest, mushrooms complete that sort of life cycle by breaking down that wood and returning the nutrients back into the soil. But they also are able to break down petroleum products um, such as uh, oil that you know may uh, be difficult to deal with in a oil spill or a pipeline breaking. So we are finding mushrooms really useful on that. Mushrooms can break down um, plastic in some cases. We'll, we'll get into some of those things in a minute here. Um, but in our moment, in our historical moment of ecological disturbance, when the Southern California is aflame and the Pacific Northwest is aflame, and we're experiencing these extreme droughts, um, mushrooms are quite useful. Um, in a number of different ways that um, if you feel sort of depressed about where the world is going, mushrooms are a really exciting place to put your head and think about some of the ways that we can redo it, do things differently um, and collaborate with um, these organisms that have been there all along. Uh, so this is the book, highly recommend if you haven't already. I'm sure some people here are probably familiar with this book. Um, there's audio book if that's your, your jam, if you're in traffic. Uh, here's a picture of the Matsutake, famously described as a, by um, the mycologist David Aurora as a combination of red hots and uh, gym socks. So it's a very pungent smell, maybe uh, um, harder to uh, convince sort of a, the American um, uh, restaurant goer, the average uh, Shingora for, for a mushroom taste this, this strong and pungent. So um, again, sort of specific to Southern California, we have um, these uh, really devastating forest fires and um, you will start to see more and more. The mycologists are in the field and using um, native and um, climate appropriate fungi to restore these destroyed um, ecosystems that mushrooms actually thrive um, in these places of, uh, of burns. That, um, so um, using oyster mushrooms to control the toxicity that is released um, in some of these fires and chemicals that are spread across the land and, and to prevent erosion. Uh, mushrooms are quite useful in a number of different ways. Um, another sort of example of mushrooms thriving under um, uh, disturbance is, is this test that was conducted in the 70s in Japan where they, these, these uh, mushroom growers and shiitake growers wanted to test this, this uh, sort of theory that mushrooms would, um, you, would be, you would have better chances of finding wild mushrooms after a lightning storm. Um, and so these shiitake growers, they uh, produce this impulse generator that would um, send an electric shock um, um, equivalent to a lightning bolt um, into this sort of sad uh, stack of shiitake logs that you can see at the bottom of this photo here. Um, so this sort of big Frankenstein apparatus that sends this lightning bolt um, into these uh, bundle of sticks that mushrooms would grow off of. And, uh, Lo and behold, the mushrooms thrive, particularly shiitake. They, um, in some cases, tripled their yields. And um, that is something that we can partially describe through science and uh, understanding. And it's also quite mysterious. Why do mushrooms uh, thrive from being electrically charged with a lightning bolt? We, we don't entirely know. Um, sort of another. Uh, Myco enigma is the prototaxides. So this is the Latin word means uh, first you, first tree. It was first identified in the 19th century by a Canadian um, archeologist who finds one of these massive uh, um, fossilized columns 
and is perplexed by what he's looking at and describes it as a tree and remarks that there are signs of fungal decomposition on this fossil um, and it carbon dates uh, predates practically all life that we know has grown outside of the ocean. So 400 million years ago, late Devonian period. Um, and in the past few decades, there's been sort of a resurgence and in interest in these fossils that we have found not just in Canada, but in the Netherlands and Saudi Arabia and along river banks at different parts of the, all over the world. Um, and it turns out that this is actually not a tree at all, but um, a lichen, uh, which is a, a combination of, of uh, algae and fungi that are, are working together to um, uh, create a hospitable environment in which the algae can produce photosynthesize, turns the sun's nutrients into uh, sugars, and then the mushroom sort of provides an environment that, where those sugars can be produced by the algae and then sort of takes a little bit of the cut, gets a little bit of those sugars. Um, so they have a symbiotic relationship that's quite complex. Um, and uh, what, how they survive, you, it, we could say it's the, the sun, but um, these sort of tower, towers, phalluses that, uh, you know, line the coast of our planet 400 million years ago, and we don't really have uh, fossilized records of that much living outside of the ocean at that time. It's uh, quite mysterious. So you can really, um, you, you don't have to uh, go very far on uh, mushroom internet until you come across a theory like this that well well you know mushrooms are from outer space and and this may be true we there have been tests where people have taken um uh uh sort of they've recreated mars clay um and as they've created asteroids and simulated um one of these rocks laden with uh, mushroom spores burning through the earth's atmosphere to see if it would survive and it does survive you know there we in theory, uh, mushrooms could have traveled from uh, another part of our galaxy into the Earth's atmosphere and created these building blocks for life on Earth. Um, we can't say that that isn't possible, but just because we can't prove that isn't possible doesn't necessarily mean that it is. But you know, if if you're in that mindset, it's that's sort of a fun place to put your head. It's sort of uh, very speculative, and and that's sort of a fun place to think about. Uh, um, there are other sort of revisionist. Uh, uh, histories um, surrounding mushrooms. So uh, not just the origins of Earth, but also the origins of Christianity. Um, there's a very uh, blasphemous and controversial book that is uh, the 1970s, The um, uh, Sacred Mushroom and the True Cross, which was um, this historian's uh, relook at the Dead Sea Scrolls to say that, much, that Christianity was born from a fertility cult that uh, was obsessed with the mushroom um, and the psychedelic mushroom and that um, Adam and Eve were not tempted by the apple but actually consumed these uh, psychoactive uh, Amanita muscaria um, in the Garden of Eden so that they had these mystical experiences that uh, um, got them in trouble with the gods if you will. Um, so you can sort of uh, swap the apple out with the mushroom you can uh, sort of a, a, a fun um, revisionist history. Uh, I'm not going to go so deep into psychedelics. It's not really my uh, area of focus or interest, but uh, certainly something that people are talking about right now. Um, you'll also hear a lot about stoned ape theory, that uh, sort of uh, complex human language and um, the ingestion of psychoactive mushrooms sort of occurs around the same time. And that, that uh, many people believe that psychedelic mushrooms sort of uh, uh, ex uh, radic uh, rapidly um, propelled like human evolution into where we are now over a very relatively short period of time. Um, of course, there are um, there's a rich history of mushrooms being used in religious and ceremonial practices um, different parts of the world. These are pre-Columbian um, uh, statues of um, depicting mushrooms being used in ceremonial um, context another pre-Columbian mushroom stone. Um, and so before we come back to um, my mushroom farm and the science of cultivation and remediation, I, I just want to point out that before humans figured out how to grow mushrooms, which wasn't that long ago, we 
couple hundred years ago, you know, people started to um, inoculate wood logs, with mushrooms and cultivate edible mushrooms for um, medicinal and um, gourmet purposes. But uh, um, insects have been, various animals have been doing it for a lot longer. So um, this is a, a really fun example of a, of a termite in West Africa that produce these massive colonies using mushrooms, um, particularly this, this mushroom called uh, Termitomyces titanicus. It's, it's one of the largest fruiting mushrooms in the world. Um, so the termites, um, they farm this mushroom and they create these colonies of mushrooms, these skyscrapers, if you will, made of mushroom uh, mycelial roots. And they sort of build these towers and towers and towers. And over time, the mushrooms start to break down. Um, they don't last forever. And so what's really clever about this whole process is that um, as the tower starts to break down, the termites go back to the older parts of the structure and start eating the walls and eating the mycelium as food. So uh, imagine if we were to build a house uh, out of mushrooms and then when our house gets old, we start building a new one and eat the old one um, you know, over the next year to survive um, while we build ourselves a new house. So it results in this very uh, massive uh, edible mushroom. I hope to try one of these one day. Um, so these are farmed by humans and by termites. Um, and they figured it out way before we did. Um, this is a split gill mushroom, a schizophyllum commune. Uh, this one is often um, mentioned because it is uh, 13, 30,000, I, I see all kinds of numbers of uh, 30,000 unique genders. Um, it really complicates the way that we can think about propagation in the natural world. Um, so let's uh, kind of take a step back of what is a mushroom? Uh, mushrooms until um, somewhat recently were believed to be um, plants, that they existed in the plant kingdom. Um, and at some point in the past 150 years, um, it was decided that no, mushrooms actually have a lot more in common with animals um, and humans than they do with plants. They don't photosynthesize. They uh, don't have chlorophyll. They don't um, have the same cell walls. They're made of chitin. Um, they use similar digestive enzymes that humans and animals do to break down nutrients, um, but they really exist in their own kingdom. And um, if you think of the mushroom as a kind of a, as a fruit tree. Um, the, the, the mushroom that we will eat, the mushroom that you'll see come out of the lawn is just a part of this massive um, living organism that the uh, mushroom exists largely underground that the spores will germinate and form these um, mycelial mushroom roots underneath the ground. And when the conditions are right, after a rainstorm, um, if the temperature is just right, they will send a, a fruit body um, off of the tree or out of the soil um, to drop spores. So this is a bit like, you can imagine that the roots underneath the, the surface are the, the tree of the apple tree. And then the fruit that comes up is just the apple. This is the reproductive uh, organ that allows the mushroom to spread its spores and produce more mushrooms in other parts of the forest or the lawn or what have you. So these spores drop underneath these umbrellas um, they get to know each other, they meet up, they, um, they spread, and these networks can be quite large. Um, I'm gonna sort of come back to that slide. Uh, this is a, a honey mushroom. Uh, it's not sweet like honey, but it looks like honey. It's an edible mushroom I really like to eat. This is a, sort of a very dirty um, sample that I pulled out of the ground. It, it grows at the base of rotting oaks. And I mentioned this mushroom because it's, uh, one of the largest living organisms on earth that this uh, mycelial network, the, the roots underneath the tree um, actually extend for uh, many, many miles that it's been around for hundreds of years. And that scientists have observed that identical DNA exists for this mushroom. Um, and one part of the forest is it does miles away that it just, it goes and goes and goes. So it's, uh, it's mass by weight is far exceeds that of a, of, you know, any whale or uh, animal on earth. Um, I really love um, this stage of its growth. It, it, it's a oak tree destroyer. So this honey mushroom, it, it has this one stage called the, uh, the, the I've heard them described as the, 
the black bootstraps that it will, it will, these black rhizomorphs will climb up a tree and it will just destroy an old tree. So if you see this honey mushroom, that means that your oak tree is probably not doing so well, but you might want to keep it around a little bit so you get those edible mushrooms. Um, just sort of a, another e large ecological concept around mushrooms that you'll hear mentioned a lot um, is how they connect um, the roots of um, plants. So uh, we know that mushrooms sort of create these information and nutrient highways between trees and plants. Um, so a particular kind of mushroom, mycorrhizal um, fungi, they, uh, they have these hyphal tips that connect with um, trees. And so if one tree is running out of nutrients or water that is actually able to receive uh, sugars and water from another part of the forest so that the, the symbiotic relationship between the fungi and the trees and the plants um, actually allows them to communicate. And um, when this was first, this idea was um, gaining popularity in the 90s, it was first described as the wood wide web. Um, I don't subscribe to that description um, because that presumes that the forest is acting like a computer and uh, that the forest is uh, acting like the internet. But in fact, our computers are acting like the forest that have been there for millions of years. So it's, uh, I, I think, uh, using um, technology to explain these uh, complex relationships between um, uh, old growth forests and ecosystems uh, really misses the mark. I think our, our forests are, are far more complex um, than these uh, network systems. Network systems exist everywhere. And if, if that's, you know, how that makes sense to you, if you want to describe that as an internet. Um, I, I just uh, personally don't don't uh, get very excited by that uh, model of thinking of it, but it is. It's a bit like a, a communication highway. Um, so these mushrooms, they have a symbiotic relationship with the uh, trees and the plants. And since the tree, the mushrooms aren't able to photosynthesize, it's uh, difficult for them to produce their own sugars. Um, it is able to uh, make exchanges with the trees that can photosynthesize. So the tree is say, okay, I've, you know, I produce all the sugar from converting the sun's nutrients into sugar, um, but I need minerals. So the, the fungi comes along and says, okay, well, I've got phosphorus and I have these minerals and I can connect you with your buddy down the street, um, you know, for this price. If you can give me a little bit of that sugar, I can, I can, you know, help you get this other stuff that you need. So pretty interesting, very complex. Um, we have uh, only described um, about 10% of the fungi that we believe to be um, on our planet. Uh, and only a small portion of these are actually producing mushrooms um, or a mycorrhizal connecting the trees. Um, there are many fungi that just live in our soils and um, really haven't captured the imagination of enough scientists to be studied closely. Um, but uh, yeah, we the estimates for fungi go as high as 4 million. I've seen one estimate at 10 million. Uh, so there are a lot of fungi on earth and um, they're largely um, misunderstood. If you try to identify mushrooms, it can be quite difficult um, because the names are changing all the time. DNA barcoding has really, um, uh, I'm gonna circle back around. We could, we could really get to the complex and the vastness of mushrooms on earth. Um, but I, I want to get to a few more uh, stories. Uh, so um, this is a slime mold. Um, so this is a sort of myco adjacent and often slime molds will be referred to as molds, but they're actually their own kingdom. They're quite complex. These have more in common with amoebas and single cell organisms uh, than they do with fungi, but uh, they sort of end up in the same field of studies uh, just by sort of an arbitrary grouping. Um, you see slime molds everywhere. They're very, like, even less understood than uh, um, fungi and mushrooms. They're often much smaller, too. Um, and as far as I know, slime molds are not really used for food production. So, um, yeah, very, very mysterious. Uh, the, I just wanted to mention slime molds as sort of a, um, adjacent to uh, mycology, but also because there's some interesting studies with slime molds. They're, um, for single-celled organisms, they can be quite intelligent. Um, so this is a, a famous test that was done of using mushrooms or, or slime molds to um, um, uh, 
strategize for urban planning. Um, so this is a map of Tokyo and each of these um, sort of light nodes on the map here represent a city center um, within Tokyo. So um, that, that were um, um, marked by pieces of oat for nutrients for the slime mold to eat. So they introduce the slime mold into the map of Tokyo and send this um, slime mold running to all of these um, vectors within the map to see how it um, would sort of uh, uh, strategize its its travel across this map. Um, and lo and behold, the, the slime mold created almost a carbon copy of the uh, transit system in Tokyo that it was, it was quite efficient at finding the fastest routes um, and most efficient routes to connect all of these nutrients to send it back to its sort of a mother host. So quite interesting. Um, there is the, uh, the truffle, of course, which is a mushroom that fruiting body that grows underground. Um, we, these are, are um, prized natural ingredients. They're quite expensive. Um, you know, a, a black or white truffle from France or Italy can go for up to thousands of dollars under certain circumstances. Um, used to be uh, harvested and hunted by pigs, and now we um, are using dogs. Um, but one story that I heard at the Los Angeles Mycological Society that I love to share is um, the, story, the relationship between the North American deer truffle and um, the flying squirrel. So this, you know, airborne squirrel has a close relationship with this underground uh, mushroom. Um, and so what happens is the flying squirrel somehow is able to identify where these truffles are growing and swoop in and dig these truffles up, take it up into the trees and eat this kind of fleshy protein rich outer layer it's quite uh, desirable to the um, to the flying squirrel, and then when it gets to this bitter core full of spores in the middle, um, the mushroom has evolved to kind of make the middle part of its mushroom um, uh, unappetizing to the squirrel. So when it gets to this point, it chucks the the spore core over its shoulder, and it's hiding up in the trees with its food stash. And then this spore core hits all the branches and explodes its spores across the forest and travels across the forest floor making more truffles. So um, I, I love that story. I think it's a very poetic relationship between sort of the airborne squirrel and this underground mushroom. Um, the the um, truffles are actually have an etymological uh, root to the, the, the uh, word for testicles. So these are uh, the testicles of the earth, the mushrooms that grow underground, subterranean, um, pretty cool. Uh, another really fun one is the, the desert truffle that is a truffle that doesn't really have that much nutrients. It's in abundance in parts of the Middle East. Um, but the Roman elites were so obsessed with the food of the pharaohs that they would pour uh, all these resources into um, uh, fleets of ships that would row across the Mediterranean and bring these food of the pharaohs back to um, these banquets that were being hosted in ancient Rome. And, um, you know, I, you don't, you don't, maybe these mushrooms will come back in popularity, but they have uh, far less pungency and inherent flavor than the, you know, prized white and black truffles. And, but the reason that the Roman elites weren't using those truffles is because those were associated with poverty. That no one wanted to eat the black and white truffles of the Italian hillsides because uh, that's what the, peasants were eating and digging up with their gross pigs and, and mud and, and that imagery just wasn't as uh, sexy as the food of the pharaohs, even though, you know, the um, massive amount of time and resources that it took to row across the um, Mediterranean really just resulted in these um, kind of a starchy, not so um, flavorful ingredients. Um, uh, Charles Darwin's daughter was um, has a as, as sort of a disturbing relationship with this uh, this um, group of um, fruiting mushrooms. So maybe you've encountered one of these before. But uh, the very psychedelic-looking stinkhorn mushrooms that smells um, very foul um, when fresh. Uh, it smells um, sometimes described as carcass or fecal matter. 
Um, it's um, something that is very, um, it attracts a lot of flies and uses the flies to kind of spread its spores to other places that it needs to propagate. Um, so you see these netted fungi. Um, but Henrietta, my computer froze here again. Give me just a moment, guys. Hello, here we go. So um, Eddie or Henrietta, um, Charles Darwin's daughter, um, was a bit of a religious zealot and a bit prudish when it came to sex um, to the point that Charles Darwin actually wrote in Latin when he was describing the sexuality of um, sexual activity of monkeys um, so that his Henrietta wouldn't edit his paper and censor him um, because she couldn't read Latin or speak Latin. Um, so she um, was very dis particularly disturbed by the stink horns that were growing on her property. So um, she famously um, scoured the property on a daily basis looking for these stink horn mushroom fruits. Um, got a frozen computer here again, give me just a moment. So, um, so uh, Henrietta would collect these specimens, um, these phallic symbols, bring them back to her house and uh, burn them ceremonially in a fire to rid the landscape of these phallic symbols that reminded her of sex. So um, I don't know exactly what happened, Henrietta, but I, I have a feeling that she, her life was, was, um, was, was marred by a lot of fear and, and, and sadness. So uh, poor Henrietta. Um, stinkhorns are quite fascinating. I would love to figure out how to grow them one day. Um, you will see. Um, they uh, actually look a lot like truffles when they first emerge. They have these sort of egg sacs and then they emerge. So the uh, truffle expert that I spoke with said that a lot of people will send him stink horns in the mail thinking that their truffles say, hey, you know, what is this truffle that I found? And then this like, stinky carcass will, you know, be like the soggy package arriving at his doorstep. Um, so these mushrooms are actually um, edible. Um, so in parts of Asia, these are referred to as the bamboo mushroom because on bamboo scraps, uh, these netted fungi are farmed and then dried. So at your Asian supermarket, you'll actually find these stink horn mushrooms. And I've actually never cooked with them before, but I've heard that they're uh, really nice in soups. Um, so um, yeah, I guess that, that pungent flavor is maybe um, really just my Western conditioning. I don't know. I haven't tried them yet, but this would be a really interesting mushroom to try to cultivate one day. I'm not sure how that would work in Southern California, but um, yeah. So um, mushrooms, they have uh, all of these really unique medicinal compounds that are useful to us. So uh, I really love this mushroom lion's mane. It's one of my favorites to grow at Myco Myco. It's a crab, a crabby sort of lobster-like um, umami um, mushroom meat. Uh, many people are intimidated by these white pom-poms, um, but they cook really, really well. It's a great alternative to meat. Um, you get these dense pom-poms and um, they fry up really nicely. You'll see a lot of um, uh, crabless crab cake recipes or vegan crab cake recipes with these. Um, and um, on my website at the end, if you want to, if you're interested, um, my, my friend Carlos, who has a um, Elberia truck here in El Sereno, um, he created, he crafted a recipe for Maiko Maiko using um, these lion's mane that uh, is uh, chili, uh, lion's mane chilaquiles. So if you're interested in that, um, a sort of a break from the, the crab recipes. But I, I bring this in the slide because um, lion's mane is getting a lot of um, attention right now and the research that is being done with this mushroom and its um, unique medicinal compounds. So um, there, we're developing treatments for Alzheimer's and dementia using this mushroom. It, it, um, it looks like a brain and it's actually quite good for our brain. It um, um, encourages neurite connection. Uh, I'm not a doctor. I can't you know, make claims about this mushroom that I can't, but there are peer reviewed um, trials and um, um, journal um, um, studies that are published in journals, scientific journals around the world about this mushroom and the, the really uh, beneficial mushroom um, pro, um, the beneficial properties that it has for the human brain and its ability to um, preserve memory and in, improve focus as we get older and kind of reverse the aging process in our brains. So this is a mushroom that I use daily. 
Um, you'll see Chaga come up a lot. Um, I just want to mention that I think there's a lot of buzz around these medicinal fungi. Um, I would be really cautious and really skeptical of the chaga that you're buying. And I would do a lot of research if this is a mushroom that you're really interested in. Um, it's one of the only um, fungi that we have seen convincing um, um, evidence that, that it, it is affected from over harvesting. Um, so this mushroom maybe for every hundred, few hundred um, birch trees that you will see in um, sort of northern climates, this um, nutrient-rich medicinal fungi um, will ap appear as a parasite growing off of the, the birch tree. But I just, I want people to uh, maybe be aware that this sort of extraction process um, can be ecologically devastating um, and this sort of sacred medicine that has been um, utilized for thousands of years could um, go extinct if we allow companies to over extract and profit off of this uh, destructive extraction process. Um, I don't have hard data to show that um, this is going to happen. And I believe it needs to study more, but just by anybody that's collected chaga knows how hard it is to find. And these, um, these parasites take up to 10 years to properly mature. It's a very slow growing mushroom. It's not in abundance and lining the forest floor. We can't cultivate it, at least to my knowledge, or uh, hasn't been any successful efforts to um, uh, cultivate and farm this mushroom. So until that happens, um, just be really cautious about where the mushrooms that you buy are sourced from. Um, we don't want to see that. Um, so sort of uh, this is this is a very uh, tangential uh, micro presentation. Uh, I could I could make some maybe cliched uh, metaphor about how this is a bit like how the mushroom grows, but uh, this is this is just kind of how my brain works. But uh, to go off of this um, this chaga, which is technically not a mushroom fruiting body, it doesn't have gills and spores the same way that most of the bracket fungi that we're familiar with, but um, it is considered a tinder conch. And tinder fungi have this really interesting um, history that anthropologists believe um, allowed Homo sapiens to travel into colder northern climates. So when Utsi the Iceman, this, uh, this uh, traveler who, um, was, whose body was preserved in ice um, near Austria um, 5,000 years ago, um, a, you'll see a lot of studies about this, this ice man and, and we've um, looked at this preserved body to sort of study um, how Utsi lived and, and, and what the sort of people of his time, um, how they might have survived. But one of the things that doesn't get mentioned about Utsi so much is he was carrying around tinder fungi, that this tinder fungi is um, really useful for producing embers. So if you're in a wet, snowy, icy climate in, the, in, a, in a harsh season, you can have this mushroom in your back pocket like Utsi, and it's going to be a lot easier for you to start a fire than trying to get wet, cold, um, you know, wood clippings. So um, even Utsi um, was carrying around the mushroom in order to survive. It didn't work out so well for him, but uh, um, we, we have to assume that many people um, of that time were also carrying around tinder fungi in order to survive um, within the harsh natural landscape. Um, this is uh, a, the zombie mushroom. This is a really sort of um, pop crowd pleasing, um, sort of mushroom moment and the presentations that I give. Uh, the, the mushroom actually hosts itself on living insects. Um, so they take a variety of forms. They're very uh, mysterious and poorly understood. Um, these are, many of these cordyceps are um, highly medicinal for human um, use and consumption. Um, so these, these uh, spores will host themselves on the insects that um, they want to grow off of and will actually control the behavior for the, um, the ant, so, um, or the moth pupae, or the, the grasshopper, or the termite. So it'll actually change the behavior of this insect and send it back to the colony and, you know, kind of like a zombie film acting a little strange. And then um, the mushroom wants the ant to grab onto a branch above the colony and 
allow this mushroom to come out of its skull and rain spores upon the colony and turn the rest of the colony into um, into um, zombie mushrooms. But Incredibly, you will um, all insects in jungles. Um, Few are more successful. Uh, often than the ants. we've observed there that eight million individuals. In the, the, um, the other ants and insects in the colony but will identify when um, a ant is infected by this mushroom and they will go on a suicide mission where uh, a few of the worker ants will, will carry the infected These ant away from the colony and walk some as far as they can until they're able to die. Um, and a lot of mushroom a presumably comes out of the ant, but far enough from the colony that it won't um, you know, cause the collapse of, of the, the the, the insect colony. So um, pretty interesting, very dramatic. Um, I'm just going to show this uh, clip from the BBC David Attenborough um, film. Then got, like, disoriented pretty dramatic it, it time breaks a stem with its mandibles. Those afflicted that are discovered by the workers are quickly so here's the uh, suicide mission that, taking the, 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 the infected ant off site. It seems extreme, but this out of harm's way. And then, uh, like something out of science fiction, the fruiting body of the cordyceps. So every time I show this to somebody, the first question I get is, is this going to happen to humans? And no, there's no cordyceps that are strong enough to um, infect the human brain uh, that we know of. But uh, yeah, these are, these are pretty unique to the and when finished, the world of insects, and they're quite useful to us that um, instead of using pesticides, um, we can manage invasive species and unwanted um, pests in our agriculture by um, harvesting these um, parasitic fungi. And they, they're uh, quite sophisticated in that they can target small groups of species that, you know, if you're, if you're trying to get rid of an invasive beetle, you can find a cordyceps that attacks that beetle and then the rest of the insects are going to be fine. They're not pouring chemicals into the ecosystem that are going to stick around for a long time and, you know, destroy everything in the same way that, um, so this is, this is sort of where many people feel is the future of termite management. Um, you know, instead of spraying our houses with chemicals that we can actually use these cordyceps spores and um, these cordyceps treatments in order to manage the, the, um, Since the, uh, like these the sort of a natural remedy to unwanted pests in our, in our domestic and agricultural The more numerous a species becomes, settings. the more likely it will be attacked by its nemesis. Okay, so these are actually, uh, we've recently found a number of different ways to cultivate these and not just on insects. So, you know, people are quite grossed out by eating something that's grown on insects, but we, we have uh, found ways to um, create um, nat natural and combine natural ingredients and create sort of a chemical cocktail that will offer the mushroom the same things that the uh, insect will provide and produce these medicinal mushrooms. So, um, I actually got to meet William Padilla Brown. This, this is a, um, a uh, citizen scientist and um, sort of cordyceps expert based in Pennsylvania um, that really sort of put cordyceps on the map for um, America in many ways, was the first to put out um, sort of books in English about how to cultivate these medicinal mushrooms that are quite good for a respiratory system and um, hormone production. Um, and also quite good for athletes. Uh, so he's, he's gone really deep with the science and um, has sort of uh, inspired a whole generation of um, citizen scientists looking closely at cordyceps and, and uh, rare and unknown fungi. So I, I really think like people like William Fadilla Brown are kind of a poster child of the, of the um, myco community because they, a lot of a lot of people like him and, and me do not have traditional backgrounds in the sciences. Um, William Padilla Brown is very self-taught and this uh, sort of created his own um, sort of scientific field in order to do the work that he's doing now. Um, 
and it's not, uh, I, I, I just want to encourage that for people who might be listening to this and feel like this is all very complex. This is um, sort of a, a great moment for amateurs, creative experimenters, uh, people who have kind of experimental ways of thinking and working. Um, you would think that there are teams of scientists looking really closely at this, but it's a lot of people online. It's a lot of people figuring this out for the first time. Um, I've spent years reading about cordyceps and about mushrooms that I work with. Um, but if I can figure it out, um, you probably can too. Um, and you don't need a fancy lab or a PhD in order to get there. Um, uh, so yeah, these are some of the cordyceps that I grow um, on brown rice, some more examples. Uh, these are another example of um, sort of cannibalistic fungi and nematodes, which can be uh, quite um, destructive in agriculture and um, kind of a menace for physicians to deal with in the human body and in animals. Um, these kind of tiny worms. Um, mycologists were studying this recently and found uh, over a dozen ways that fungi actually hunt down nematodes and eat them. Um, so this is a very dramatic example. It's a very famous photograph that was taken under electron microscope where a uh, fungi will actually produce a lasso, these ring lasso, and um, latch on to these worms. Um, this is happening on a very kind of, you, you really have to see this under a microscope. It's not something we'd be, really be able to see with a uh, naked eye, but uh, it, it, it constricts the nematode and then starts to feed off of its carcass. Very, very metal, really beautiful. There are um, these sort of sticky buoy traps that are, the fungi create so that the nematodes will stick to these um, buoy traps and then um, and then same deal, they're, they're, the fungi start to feed off of the, the body that's trapped. Um, even examples, I don't really fully understand how this works. I've read a lot of, as much as I could find on, on, on what's actually happening here, but apparently the um, fungi have actually evolved to take small dead nematodes and dangle them like bait to lure in other larger nematodes to then consume. So um, yeah, and, and just to kind of go back, harp back on the citizen science tone of this talk or a theme of this talk um the uh internet has really done a lot for the mycological community um and science that is emerging today so and this is um owes a lot to drug culture uh, that might seem unorthodox but a lot of the science that is um, helping us understand ways that we can clean up oil spills um, and um, fabricate building materials for mushrooms has come from people um, figuring out how to grow mushrooms at home and the and for drugs. So shroomery, if you talk to mycologists, uh, the conversation will often turn back to this website called the shroomery that's been around since the 90s. It's a dinosaur of a website. This is what it looks like. Um, but uh, this this created so much data for scientists to use, not just um, people who are interested in drugs, but it sort of evolved into all things mycoscience related. Um, people identifying um, different practices for cultivation, contamination. This is what the site looks like today. I just grabbed this. Um, I went on the website so I could show an example. Um, really kind of strange people, um, a very eccentric crowd. This is a uh, sort of legendary Roger Rabbit who really um, educated a whole generation of artists on or a whole generation of mycologists on how to grow mushrooms, psychedelic, gourmet, um, functional mushrooms of all kinds. Um, and he would also post these kind of strange pictures where he would, you know, get mushrooms to grow off of his um, clothes where he and his wife would pose naked um, with mushrooms growing out of books. So when I did that book experiment, this is a sort of a homage to Roger Rabbit. Um, so, you know, the, this guy and a lot of PhDs that are at sort of, you know, global climate summits are somehow grouped together. Um, that this this kind of silly man wearing a like bra um, with fruiting mushrooms all over it is actually uh, highly revered and um, 
influential for the world that that I get to live in today. Uh, I got a frozen, what a, what a great slide for my uh, computer to freeze on again. Here we go. Um, there, uh, this is a uh, Mia Maltz um, and Danielle Stevenson are two heroes of mine. These are um, uh, citizen scientists and um, um, mushroom researchers who are focused on um, myco and phytoremediation. Um, and they're both based here in Southern California. Um, Danielle is actually a consultant for Myco Myco. Um, they have looked um, at how we can actually work and collaborate with uh, mycorrhizal fungi and they're um, pretty unique in their field. There aren't a lot of people who have um, studied closely and thoroughly how to actually put some of these ideas into practice as far as um, uh, detoxifying our um, ecosystems, rebuilding topsoils and collaborating with fungi to create um, uh, mycorrhizal relationships with the plants that we grow, make them more drought resistant. Um, this is a sort of example that Danielle gives in her talk where um, you have, you can see um, sort of a stark contrast between the plants that on this farm that have been um, introduced to mycorrhizal fungi um, and, and uh, had their soil amended with mycorrhizal fungi and then the ones that have not. So um, it, it helps in a number of different ways in uh, our state that is very um, uh, drought stressed. It, it can be quite useful um, in ways that we can um, prepare ourselves for extreme climate change. Um, and Danielle and Mia are sort of the first to um, really look closely at this in, in our area. And we really have to study how these things work in the places where we live. Um, you know, cleaning a waterway using mushrooms in St. Louis or Boston, it's gonna look really different than how we would clean a waterway in Southern California. We have different temperatures, different climates, different microbiomes. Um, we have different water quality and the mushrooms are not gonna grow the same here as they will over there. So we need um, to move towards um, uh, a, a deeper understanding of native ecosystems and native fungi and, and how we can collaborate them to solve some of these problems. Um, we can, we can um, this is an example of Paul Stamets was actually, was able to use oyster mushrooms to uh, convert uh, a pile of asphalt into um, soil. Um, where the mushrooms are actually breaking down the hydrocarbon bonds, not just absorbing the oil, but actually breaking them down into, um, you know, soil that insects can are attracted to, laying eggs on the mushrooms and bringing in birds. Within a few weeks, just a few weeks, you know, we have an ecosystem rebuilt. We have plants are starting to grow and starting to convert these uh, toxic materials into something that we can reintroduce into the land. So yeah, this is all, we, we still have a long way to go. Um, we're starting to see it pop up in popular culture. This is uh, um, in, in the fashion world. These are, this is a mushroom leather that is being used by Hermes to make their handbags now. Uh, this was started by the artist, Phil Ross, uh, who was a big inspiration for me based in the Bay Area that now runs operation uh, or helps run um, this very large operation called Microworks where they are making mushroom leather. They've sort of innovated the science. There's Ecoveda based in New York that have this sort of patent technology for making building materials out of uh, mushroom mycelium grown on agricultural byproducts. So this is sort of a uh, versions of what I'm experimenting with in my studio. Um, it's very new science. So this is sort of a design pavilion that was made in the Netherlands with the license, um, license technology from Ecoveda the mushrooms will grow on relatively any, um, virtually anything. And, um, and yeah, so I think to sort of end this talk uh, with a kind of a look forward of where things are going, um, it's not, I think we have to do, we have a lot of work ahead of us. The mushrooms are really popular, but we're just beginning and that's something really optimistic, but we also have to be really careful. Mushrooms are not the silver bullet of, um, you know, uh, they, they solve all of our problems. They, you know, we have seen examples where uh, using mushrooms to remediate waterways and clean waterways has actually further contaminated them. So 
Um, you'll see sort of a lot of pseudoscience um, and charlatans. Um, I'm not gonna have time to go into this article. Like recently, there's this whole scandal with this guy who was um, collecting hundreds of thousands of dollars to um, launch this mycelium orb product, which he claimed could sequester enough carbon in your lawn to offset three automobiles. Um, and then a lot of people called him out and said like, you know, what, what kind of mushrooms, what, what this technology doesn't exist yet? What, what are you talking about? Um, and it turns out this guy is a total, total phony um, and did a bunch of things to harass these scientists and has, has been doing it for decades in other fields too. So, um, you know, and, and you'll see these big claims. I, we, mushrooms can um, break down hydrocarbon bonds and compost plastic, but not very efficiently. And how we can do this on industrial and scale scalable operation is, is quite tricky. We haven't really figured that out. So, you know, there are these sort of clickbait think pieces about how mushrooms can break down plastic and how people can eat um, plastic. And that's really fun to think about. But in examples like this, it's, it looks like that what's being sold is the idea that you're going to eat this mushroom plastic. But um, most of what you're looking at here is mycelium growing on agar that there's a small amount of plastic that's introduced. And then these, uh, these uh, um, chefs claim that, you know, the plastic is now edible, but the small little scraps of black, of black inside of these little uh, agar pods is, is uh, um, you know, all of the plastic, you know, there, there's sort of a false promise with this. And it's, it's fun. I'm not knocking this, this project. It's, it's cool. But um, you know, converting plastic into food is, is really not as easy as we think. We have a lot of work um, and mushrooms might seem really trendy and really popular now, but we need all hands on deck and um, there's plenty of room for everybody. And um, that's kind of my spiel. I um, hope we can kind of, if you guys want to talk or if I miss anything or if you have questions, um, I would be happy. Here's my contact information. Um, my uh my website and my instagram for my art and then for michael michael the farm um i am just kind of getting set up my small basement operation i'm hoping to move to a um, larger facility within the next year um that's kind of a process we got to build out a bigger facility and um yeah I, I think growing mushrooms in la makes a lot of sense uh when i use less than two gallons of water for every pound of mushrooms that I harvest. And that includes like cleaning, dishes, mopping, all of that. It's, it's very um, efficient use of water in our very dry climate. So I, I think mushrooms make a lot of sense. It's not the only thing that we should be doing. And I am using agri agricultural byproducts that require a lot of water um, you know, in order for me to do this. But in an urban setting, I can grow these locally at a very low carbon footprint. And, and I really believe that. Um, so yeah, uh, I'll, I'll hand it back to you, Alex. Thank you so much. Thank you, Sam, so much. That was a really fantastic exploration of just how much we're learning. Um, we are, like, that's, it's really exciting to hear just all, all the, and, and to how like you, everyone can kind of get involved. And so one of the questions I saw was, how is there a native mushroom or is there an appropriate mushroom to put in our gardens here that can help with uh, growth or that that might help? So one of the things that's um, really useful about mushroom farming is we can take sawdust or byproduct from the soy industry or, or corn holes. Um, dried grasses, alfalfa, all kinds of things can be converted um, into a substrate that we can grow mushrooms off of. And after those mushrooms are fruited and after the mushrooms have gotten most of their nutrients to produce the gourmet ingredients that we can um, you know, sell at the market and, and cook with, um, those materials, that mushroom compost is really useful that actually organic farms will um, actually pay mushroom farmers to load up a trailer full of mushroom compost to amend their soil with it. It's um, really um, useful for water retention. It can, um, it, the science can get quite complex. Um, we want to encourage biodiversity in our soils um, and often our agricultural practices and, and restoration practices have not um, 
given much uh, attention to mushrooms, the role that mushrooms play um, in all of this. So, um, you know, bringing in mushroom compost and encouraging mycorrhizal fungi is really the direction that we want to be going for, but it's quite complex. I, I'm not going to say that, hey, use my lion's mane blocks and my reishi blocks in your garden beds and all your problems are going to be solved and if you have contamination. Um, but um, anecdotally, and, and we know that it's useful, people are paying for it. Um, and the science is quite complex, but we know that plants benefit from it. I know cactus growers who claim that they get 30 years of growth in um, a four year period um, after they amend their cactus soil with mushroom blocks. So um, there's a lot happening there. I grow saprobic mushrooms, um, but a lot of studies that I'm seeing um, suggest that those create pathways for the mycorrhizal fungi that are really useful that I brought up during my talk. Um, so there's all kinds of complex relationships between the different kinds of fungi, the microbes and the bacteria that are already in our soil, um, but um, encouraging that fungal matter can be really useful and also very complex and really um, specific to the climate site and problems that are trying to be solved. Um, and that's something that I'm trying to study. I'm just very reluctant to make big sweeping generalization and claims about how one mushroom can be used in a thousand different ways. Well, that's also how we talk about right tree, right place for our plantings. It's going to be it's going to be very specific to climate zones, and I'm sure it's 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 dependent on soil type. So um, there's not, there's not an easy answer. Um, and if some, anyone's interested in learning more about uh, my silly uh, about fungi, what, is there a course you would recommend? Is there a, like beyond the books that you've stated? Um. I mean, in the next three years, I'd love to be able to be offering that in Los Angeles. Um, there's a lot of things online. You'll find a lot of resources on growing psychedelic mushrooms just because there's a lot of attention on that right now and a lot of interest. And I think just people find that kind of exciting. Um, but um, I would direct people towards um, Peter McCoy, who started uh, Radical Mycology. He he leads a lot of workshops. I actually took my first mushroom cultivation workshop in 2015 um, here in LA when he had kind of a traveling workshop. Um, he has an institute in the Pacific Northwest um, that I believe is still doing workshops, but I don't know, we're gonna start to see a lot more options. There is no university department that has like a dedicated mycology, you know, studies curriculum. Um, not yet. Not yet. There are places that have mycology courses and then, you know, like Danielle and Mia Maltz have carved out dissertations and PhD um, degrees, you know, with a focus on mushroom studies, but they've ha had to build that for themselves that, and, and against a lot of, um, there's a lot of pushback. People don't really take mushrooms that seriously and that's starting to change. So you'll, we'll see more of it, but there aren't a lot of options. You really, um, the internet, the internet is a great source. You have to, kind of sparse out the noise and people have all say all kinds of things on the internet a lot of things that aren't true um but there's a lot of really great people that are sharing and um taken really seriously within the industry i, I really hope we can maintain this culture of people um uh sharing their knowledge um and not just uh being so closed lip and just going to like lowering up and patents. I think people are starting to see dollar signs around the mushroom industry right now. And I'm worried that we'll lose this kind of um, collaborative citizen science. So I, I feel that over the next few years, I have kind of plans of how I would like to give back in my own ways. That doesn't mean I share everything that I do, but there are ways that I think that I could make myself useful. So I really encourage people who do get into this to um, not be gatekeepers and um, yeah, be, be of use. <laughs> um, yeah, the people that I've all learned from are all people like that, that did not make money off of, you know, the YouTube videos that they posted that I, I learned so much from. Um, and there's only a few, like really, um, like Paul Stamets, Peter McCoy, and Trent Cotter have books in English, but there aren't a lot out there. There's a couple science journals, and, you know, if you have access to an academic library or, um, like, online system, you can find things um but uh yeah it's 
it's it's it's all out there like peter mccoy's book was released five years ago and a lot of people i talk to in consultations say like you know a lot of those practices are dated now it's moving so fast so the internet really um aids itself to this field that's growing so quickly the science is moving mm -hmm. so fast that's so exciting and thank you sam so much for doing this um these will this is going to be recorded and put on our youtube it's on our facebook right now um Thank you, Sam, and everyone have a great day. Take care.